But now we play music and roll credits, and that was Spock Amok, an episode that I have already watched two times, and I'll probably watch again. <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. What were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is probably one of my favorite ones so far. Yeah. Yeah, except for Mbinga's fly fishing. It didn't really look like a fly fishing rod to me, but, you know, who knows what the fly fishing uh, equipment will look like in a in a while. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know what? I, I didn't even pay that much attention to the rod. I just, the hat looked like a fly fisherman's hat. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I don't think any writer on there actually had ever been fly fishing before. That was probably it. But <laughs> Probably not, but you know what? There's 10 million magazines about fly fishing. You could grab one and go... Yeah. Oh, hey, that's what a fly fishing rod looks like. <laughs> now, it's a different thing if the prop department just can't get one. That's a whole other deal. But yeah, <laughs> I happen to know a prop master up in Canada who's worked on very, very cheap productions who's never had trouble turning anything up in his life. So yeah, um, going back to a mock time. So in the nightmare here, he imagined that Tapering would invoke the Caliphy. Yes. And then, uh, in reality, that actually happened in a muck time. Yeah. When he was fighting Kirk. <laughs> yep. And to be fair, in a mock time, it was a very logical and cold blooded thing that she had thought out because she lays out her plan at the end. You know, if you were killed, I'd have Stan. If you won, you'd be so disgusted by having had killed your friend that you'd leave. I'd have Stan. You know, <laughs> she was like, I've already figured out every, every way this can end. And I get what I want every time. Yeah, I forgot that about her. I don't know. It, unless they elaborate more on the relationship, I just don't foresee why it would be like that. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing there must be no other way out of a betrothal on Vul Vulcan. Your your promise to each other when you're children, and that's that. I'm guessing. Yeah, that's probably that's probably fair. And um, she does seem way more um reliant on cold logic than Spock is at times. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm sure this is one of those things, even, even though alien human hybrids irritate me in Star Trek, but this is one of those times where, you know, him being half human would have to explain like some of why he's not as Vulcan as she is, you know? Yeah. Just by nature. Even though we know the Vulcan is a the Vulcans made a choice to be logical, it wasn't like a biological imperative. So you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, just to just to round this out, you know, I'm uh, it was a like most of the series has been. It's a nice uh, reprieve from the universe, uh, saving the universe every week. And this was even less in scope than that. What we've had five episodes now. We're halfway through this first season. So, so far out of five episodes, there hasn't been a stinker yet. And outside of the original series, I don't think that has ever been the case in any series of Star Trek since Next Generation. That first season of Next Gen was rough. That first season of DS9 was rough. First season of Enterprise was rough. The first season of Voyager was rough. I don't know, man. That first season of Discovery like hit on all cylinders for me. Well, I, you know, I hadn't quite gotten to that far because I was trying to remember back to when I watched that. And I was going to say, okay, I don't know that I enjoyed the first five episodes on Discovery as much. But, yeah, they weren't as bad as the first five episodes of, say, Next Generation. I mean, plus, though, you can't really look at this as the first season of Strange New Worlds, though. They did get a practice round, didn't they? They got a whole practice season. And it happened in the second season of an already established show, so... The writing was already basically up to snuff. Most of the actors in the on the ship knew what was going on, knew their characters fairly well. So, yeah, man, like uh, they just uh, were set up for success. I think <laughs> it could be. I mean, it seems like they know exactly where they want to go with it. They kind of understand the structure they want to use. Like, cause so far, we've gotten a first contact episode. A submarine episode, a comedy episode. These are all well-worn Star Trek tropes. They just put their own spin on them. And tropes aren't, you know, there's nothing wrong with using tropes. It's this is how you explore the characters within an established area. And they seem to know what they're trying to do with it. And it just, it seems to be paying off. Yeah, it definitely doesn't seem like they're just making stuff up as they go. Like um, some other shows do. 
Yeah, it feels like they have they have a direction, they have a plan. They know who these characters are. Now, granted, like you were saying, you know, some of these characters have been around for a long time, so they're easier to get to understand. But five great episodes and good to great episodes in a row is just amazing to me, I think. Yeah, that's good. Looks like there's kind of a funny one coming up next week. Why don't you tell us about it, Chris? Oh, yeah. Well, for this one, the um, action begins in a futuristic slum. Hammer and a genetically enhanced computer date casually. (laughs) Unfortunately, she, quote-unquote, is abducted by an otherworldly plant. In the end, she leaves him for the plant, and he is left sad. Oh, poor Hammer. Yeah. Uh, Well, you know what? It still sounds like a good episode with uh, plenty of comedy beats in it, so I'm ready for it. (laughs) Yeah, we didn't see Hemmer at all in this episode, so it'll be nice to have one focused on him. Yeah, it will be. I like how they're doing that too, how they're kind of spreading out the spreading out the heavy lifting each episode, a different person <laughs> or a different group, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 